I have taken thy measure, bringer of light. And I judge thee a worthy champion. The task of excising the sin that hath taken root in man's heart is thine. Shrink not from employing thy strength in service to the forest and the wider realm beyond. Like hungering shadows do the enemies of harmony gather, and meekness will but feed them. If man is to be delivered from the dark, it shall be by thy guiding light alone. Stray not from the path, for if thou dost, thy people shall be truly lost. Thou hast slain the Lord of Levin. A regrettable act, but a necessary one. In witnessing thy struggle, a truth hath been revealed unto me. If I mistake not, it may yet prove a chink in the eternal armor of the Asians. But let us conclude our present business. I shall expound upon my findings at the Rising Stones anon. You are returned to us, dear friend, and none the worse for bearing the heavy burden which I did press upon you. Most glad am I of this. 
I am informed that your efforts to negotiate a peace with Lord Ramu ended in conflict. Pray tell me, what befell? Ramu made trial of you? I fear there is truth to his claim. It is the darkness within us that attracts the darkness without. It cannot be denied that misfortune follows man. For evidence, one need only look to the conflict brewing in Cartano, or to the rising flood of refugees. Our shared struggle against the Empire should have served to seal our union. Yet the ties which bind the Alliance strain under the weight of gross self-interest. As the scars of the Calamity begin to fade, so too does our sense of common purpose. Yet now is scarce the time to forget our shared responsibility. If this new sprung realm is to survive beyond its infancy, it must needs be nurtured by all. Eorzea must be as one, yet I fear that dream is still far off. On behalf of the people of Gridania, and the Elementals both, I thank you for all that you and your fellow Scions have done. Full oft have I been compelled to look to you for aid of late, and offered all too little in return. As leader of this nation, I shall endeavor to prove a more worthy ally to your cause henceforth. Lord Ramu has departed, yet the keening of this ill wind grows no less insistent. Voices of the forest, pray speak and I shall listen. What unseen evil begets this unease in my heart? If everyone is ready, let us begin. Uriange, the floor is yours. As all here assembled now know, in its final hours as our Order's headquarters, the Waking Sands did play host to a most unexpected visitor. I speak of the Asian clad in white, Elidibus. Unwelcome though his presence was, 
His words that day did serve to confirm a truth long suspected, that the Asians are eternal beings to whom physical destruction is as a temporary inconvenience. In the intervening time, Ariange and I have striven to discover a means by which the Asians might more permanently be slain. And tis my belief that we have found the thread that will allow us to unravel the twisted skein of their existence. In the moments prior to Leviathan's most recent manifestation, the Sahagin Elder who summoned him was observed to undergo some manner of ascension. The etheric readings taken by Yashtola at the time of this transfiguration have proven most enlightening. The disruption to the flow of ether was sudden and dramatic. So tangible was the agitation, I scarce had need of my goggles. The significance of Yashtola's readings might better be understood in the context of mine own, taken at the instant of the Lord of Levin's demise. Unlike the Primal, the Sahagin was not subject to etheric dissipation. Before discussing our new discoveries, it may benefit us all to recall what we know of etheric behavior. Let us begin at what some might call the end. When we who dwell in the material realm die, our spirits dissolve into the flow of ether and are returned to the ethereal realm. In turn, the restless energy which suffuses that plane streams back into our world, giving rise to new life. Tis as the heavens did decree, the way of all mortal souls. Twixt this world and the next do the ethereal current swirl, bearing the very essence of life. Thus doth the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth continue unabated. Primals behave somewhat differently. In order to manifest and then maintain a physical presence in this realm, they must consume vast quantities of ether, most often in the form of crystals. Though they may seem to live, their flesh is but ether given shape. Thus, a defeated primal leaves behind no broken corpse. Rather, the essence of its form seeps back into the land whence it came, and the energy of its shattered spirit is called back to the ethereal realm. And there it waiteth, till next the prayers of the faithful do draw it forth from the sea of ether to take their offering of crystals and make for itself a new body. Which brings us on to the third group, the so-called immortals. They exist in a manner all their own. Quite. Even as the Sahagin Elder fell to the Admiral's musket shot, I witnessed the release of an ethereal cloud, which immediately took possession of a nearby minion. A soul that dissipateth not upon the death of the flesh. The secret of life everlasting, and in the claws of a Sahagin no less. But I wonder, what would happen to one of these obstinate spirits, should there be no suitable host for it to claim? If mortal death entails a return to the ethereal realm, it seems doubtful that the soul of an immortal would venture there. Nay, it merely withdraweth the distance, unto the shore of the ethereal sea, perchance, but no further. Yes, it exists in neither this realm nor the next, abiding instead in the space that lies between them. The Asians took control of Thancred by means of a crystal of darkness, an artifact which, if our theories are correct, serves as a gateway to the place I have just described. I was hoping people had forgotten about that. I am sorry, my friend. For a mercy, the weary road of our research hath brought us unto an answer.
The Sahagan ascended to an immortal state, but he did not possess a crystal of darkness through which to flee this realm. Thus was he consumed by Leviathan. If we could entrap the spirits of defeated Asians in like manner, and thereby deny them resurrection... Therein lieth the path to victory. Thou art most perceptive, my lady. Only when we have trapped the bodiless soul within an ethereal prison can we hope to defeat its unnatural constancy. Thus might even an eternal paragon be consigned to oblivion. These feats are, of course, far easier said than done. At present, we lack a viable means to entrap and extinguish an Asian soul. Yet, I believe it to be possible. The pieces of the puzzle lie before us. We have but to put them together. I will depart at once to convene with the sages of Charlian. Together shall we divine the steps by which our goals may be achieved. I have the utmost faith in you, Archon. Beg pardon, antecedent, but I would raise one final matter. Even now, a Charlian survey party seeketh to ascertain the fate of the students of Baldessian. Their findings shall soon be known to us. Though you harbor feelings of dread, I bid you surrender not to sorrow, but abide instead in hopeful prayer. I shall, Archon. Thank you. <laughs>